Hey, good to see you this morning. Can I, can I introduce you to some special guests? Do you mind? So uh, our, our son Wesley is here, and I think the first time at Bethel. Raise your hand, Wes. He, that's what I looked like when I was his age. <laughs> his, his wife is Dylan. We love her, and she's with Wes right there. And we, and yeah, you can go ahead and welcome him if you want to. You want to do that. <laughs> You've heard me speak often of aid and redemption. He's with us today. Our grandson, aid and redemption, brought his dad, Jesse Long, and his wife, our daughter, Holly Long. So we want to welcome them too. So, <laughs> so there you go. They're special guests. You are a special guest. And I've been, uh, I've been uh, thinking about you all week. Uh, thinking about what the Lord uh, would have us to talk uh, about. I have a friend, uh, a really dear friend whose name is Gary. And Gary worked for the power company, worked for the gas company. And yet, but Gary was really a farmer at heart. Man, he loved farming and all things farming. Gary said to me, I can get you into the Farm Science Review. And I'm like, let's do that. So we stopped at this big place where farmers eat breakfast. That was the highlight of the day. We had a serious breakfast, and then we went to the Farm Science Review there in Central State down south. And, um, and we went in there to the Farm Science Review, and uh, it was every imaginable kind of exhibit uh, stuff for sale for farmers. And I noticed that, that when Gary would go into, uh, we'd walk up to a salesman. Now, the salesman would, uh, he'd say, I'm Gary, and he'd, Gary would ask him about something agricultural, but somewhere in that conversation, usually toward the front end of the conversation, this is the question that the salesman would ask. So, how many acres are you farming? It was always that question. So now, how many acres you got in corn? How many acres you got in beans? How many, how many acres are you farming? And then Gary would kind of uh, clear his throat and say, well, I'm, uh, right now I'm, I work for the gas company. And then the guy would say, hey, it's good to talk with you. Then he would completely turn away from Gary. And he would look at somebody else. I loved Gary. Gary is and was a dear friend of mine. And every time that happened to Gary, it hurt me in my heart. And that should never happen in church. Take your Bibles. Let's look in James. This is what James, the pastor of the Jerusalem church, had to say about that. Book of James. Of course, we're in a series in the book of James. And if, if you missed them, you could back up and get them because we catch them on video and we catch them on audio. But um, well, here's what we've said so far. James is talking about real faith. And he said that, J James has said real faith endures trials and real faith resists temptation and real faith is visible and active. And today, here's the big idea. He's going to say real faith rejects pride and prejudice and partiality. That's what he says in the text. Real Christians reject pride and prejudice and partiality. And he's going to say it in really clear and unvarnished terms. Listen to what James says. This is, the text is James in chapter 2 and verses 1 through 13. Rich, rich stuff. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and, becomes, and become judges with evil thoughts, with evil thoughts, with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. You are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court. Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin. If you show partiality, you're, you're committing sin. And you're, you're convicted by the law as transgressors. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. 
For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. And mercy triumphs over judgment. Fred says, there's a lady in the choir. She took off her robe, she hung it up, she walked out to the pastor, Fred, and she said, I'm done. I'm done. That's my last time I'm going to sing an anthem in this church. And he said, well, what is it? What, what happened? She said, they talk about love, but they don't love me. And I'm done. That was my last song. And Fred says to her, no, no, no. He says, that's not true. They do love you. We love you. He said, I, I travel around. I meet Christians all over the world. They're loving people. She says, okay, give me a name then. Give me a name. Somebody who really, who really cares about me, who really loves me. She says, give me a name. Fred says, so, can I give her your name? Oh, but don't answer too fast. Could you, could you say, I, no, no. No, my love is genuine for people. No, no, I, I really love people. I really, I really do. Rich people, poor people, smart people, not smart people. Men and women, all different colors. No, I, no, I love, I really, my love is sincere. Is it? And that's a good question. That's the question that James wants us to ask. So you say you're a follower of Jesus. Really? Really? Jesus who loved broken, unlovely people, other people didn't even notice. Are you the follower of that Jesus? Is that love in your heart? Do you, to jump over into Peter, do you love the brother with a pure heart fervently? Is that true about you? That's a good question, right? So James, Pastor James says real faith, real Christians have real love. And they, and they show that love without pride or, or prejudice or partiality. And he says, that's, he says, he's going to say in the text, that's evil. That's evil. He says in the text, you're, you, you, you're joining people with people who blaspheme God when you're prejudiced. Is there anybody in the house that could say, I have never uttered a, a prejudicial word? Is there anybody in the house that can say, I've always acted in sincere love toward people who are different than me? Is there anybody that doesn't need a little talk here? about this. I think we do. God thinks we do. And so uh, I've been to pastor's meetings often. You would think at the farm science review you might have people that are asking how many acres you farm, but at the pastor's meeting you wouldn't have people asking how many people you pastor, right? They would never say, so how was your offering last week? Not at a pastor's meeting, right? They would never say, what was your offering? How big of a church do you pastor? How large is your parish? People, people ask me that. How large is your parish? I said, I haven't measured it. It takes a long time to drive from one end to the other. I, but I haven't measured it. It's like, how, how large is your parish? How, how, many, how important really are you? This shouldn't be that way at church. My dad, who always pastored small churches, pastored well and faithfully and still does. And he would come home from the pastor's meetings very discouraged sometimes because people were asking him, how many acres are you farm in? That always hurt me. I made up my mind when I grow up and if I get to be a pastor, I go to the pastor's meeting. That's the question I'm never going to ask anybody. I'm just going to encourage pastors. My dad came home one day and said, pastor's meetings are like peacock shows. Pastor's meeting. <laughs> Humble followers of Jesus strutting their stuff at the pastor's conference. What up? Are you kidding me? Really? That's, that's, what, the, that's what we do? That, that happens. And so I, I, I want to be the... I wanna be the follower of Jesus who went into town looking for people who actually were ashamed of the things they had done. I want to be a follower of Jesus, the one who came into town looking for people who were like a little off, a little broken, a little weird, a little rough around the edges, you know, like us, right? Like us. A lady in the church one time, we had a ministry that, that served people who didn't have much. And I was, I was walking through and getting a little bit of a tour, and she says without realizing what she was saying, 
what I do is I just treat these people as if they were just like me. You ever do that? I'm just going to preach, I'm just going to preach these lesser beings like as if they were as wonderful as I am. Like you might have missed something in Sunday school. You ain't wonderful. You're a sinner. You're broken. You're messed up. Yes, you are. No exceptions. Theological term, total depravity. You're helpless. Morally helpless. And so, so you have, um, let's just say this. Let's say you shouldn't be proud and, and prejudiced and you shouldn't show partiality. And I want to show you from James' text here four really powerful things to think about. When you're tempted to be proud or show partiality or, or prejudice. The first one is when you're tempted with pride, prejudice, and partiality, remember the Lord. In the text, he's called the Lord of glory. Remember the Lord. When you're thinking about other people and you, remember the Lord. Let's look back at the text. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. One day, the gates of heaven are going to swing open, right? And the Lord of glory, the glorious Lord, Jesus Christ, our King and Savior, is going to sweep through the gates. And then we're going to see greatness. Keep that in mind when you think about how you're going to treat his kids. Keep that in mind when you decide how you're going to treat his creatures. Everybody on earth is one of his kids or one of his creatures, right? One of his children by faith are one of those who he has created and made. And they should have dignity, the Lord of glory. We keep the Lord of glory in mind. Man, C.S. Lewis said something powerful on this. Can I read it to you? It's from an essay called The Weight of Glory. Actually, a sermon he preached once called The Weight of Glory. It's a, it's a bit of an extended quote, but worthwhile. So stay with me on this. It may be possible, he said, he's, Lewis is saying, in this quote, C.S. Lewis is going to say, this is how we should look at people. Let me just say this before I read the quote. So I'm going to camp this week. Pray for me. Well, yeah, I'm going up to Camp Barrack. I'll love to go there. I'm going to preach the kids, so pray for me, will you? And for the kids, they, they so need the Lord, and they so need encouragement. I appreciate it if you'd pray for me. And what, the camp that I go to, one of them that I love a bunch, has the, 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 where you go. And, and by the way, God goes to all Bible preaching camps, and he meets kids there. But anyway, the one I'm going to this week has fires in, in the front of the chapel, one on one side, one on the other. And a cool Michigan night, even in the summertime, sometimes they'll start those fires up. And I will be standing between the fires every night this week, lifting up Jesus to kids. I'm writing a book, did I tell you this? And the book is going to be called Between the Fires, Lessons That I Teach Kids When I Stand Between the Fires. Let me tell you one of them, it's this. Try to see people the way Jesus sees people. That's a revolutionary idea. Try to look at people. Just say, how does Jesus look at this person? Now, C.S. Lewis is going to help us He's going to, in a beautiful way, describe the way Jesus sees people. It may be possible for each to think too much of his own potential glory hereafter, but it's hardly possible for him to think too often or too deeply about that of his neighbor. The load or the weight or the burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid on my back a load so heavy that only humanity can carry it, and the backs of the proud will be broken. Lewis is saying, man made in God's image bears the weight of the glory of God, reflects what God is like. And so we should treat people carefully, right? He says, it is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses to remember that the dullest and the most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare all day long we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the awe and circumspection or care proper to them that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another. All friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people, he said. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations and cultures and arts and civilization, these are mortal. 
Their life is to ours the life of a gnat, but it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. This does not mean that we are um, perpetually solemn. We must play. But our merriment must be of the kind, and it is in fact the merriest kind, which exists between people who have from the outset taken each other seriously. No flippancy, no spite of of, of which we love the sinner, um, no superiority, sorry, no presumption. Our charity must be real and costly love with deep feeling for the sins in spite of which we love the sinner. And he concludes by saying, your neighbor might be the holiest object ever presented to your senses. Get that? Like people are, I think they've said around here for years, right? People are matter to God. People are important to God, so they're important to us. That's what he was saying in a, in a flowery and poetic way. People matter to God. He made them. And some of them he will redeem. And all of them bear his glory. No matter what they're like, what kind of food they eat. So if you're a follower of Jesus, who, by the way, was not a white man, it might be a good idea for you to have a high regard for all people that's sincere, that you talk the same privately about people as you do publicly about people, or, or just stop calling yourself a Christian because you're a, you're a bad testimony if that's what you do. We do, have some, we do have some house to clean on this, right? And so the first thing to think about here is, as you look there in the text, is when I'm tempted to pride or prejudice or partiality, just think about the Lord who loves and who made, made all people. Notice this too, it's just, just interesting in verse 3. It, you could easily read over this and miss it. it he says, um, you know, he's telling the story about the guy that comes in dressed fancy and the guy that comes in dressed shabby. And you're, you're treating one, you know, real carefully and you're disregarding the other one. And then he says... In verse 3, in a little tiny powerful understatement, if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing. Stop right there. If you pay attention, isn't that interesting? If you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing. I have a theory. Everyone has attention deficit disorder. Eddie, am I right? Am I right? Thank you. Can I get a witness? I'm like, can I get some attention here? I would like to have some attention. Not, not, not everybody likes public attention. That's embarrassment. But everybody likes attention. It's like you're a person. You matter. I stop. I look at you. I listen to you. I talk to you. I care about you. I pray for you. I know your name. I know your kids. I know your story. You're important to me. If you pay attention, hey, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a powerful understatement in verse 3 there. Just pay attention to people. Christian people pay attention to Everybody out to other people, even if they can't milk something out of them. They pay attention to people, even if they're not like the beautiful people, even if they're not like the popular people, even if they're not like the money people, even if I can't get something out of you. If I'm a Jesus follower, I give you attention. Church is the place where you ever go to church and go, I don't know why I'm going today. The guy goes on and on, and I can watch him on the video anyway. Why would I do that? I can pick up coffee somewhere else. People are here who need your attention. That's why. You don't just come to church for you. you just, that's, that would be selfish. That would not be Christian. Why do you come to church? Because people are there who need your attention. You pay attention to a mom who's struggling to raise those little kids alone. You pay attention to that little boy who only sees his daddy every once in a while. You pay attention to that young man whose dad just doesn't have it together, and he mistreats him all the time. You pay attention to that boy. You pay attention to a person who looks like they have it all together, but nobody has it all together. There isn't anybody you know that has it all together. That's why one of the reasons we come into an assembly is to pay attention to everybody. Little children and the aged and men and women. If you pay attention... To the one who wears fine clothing, you should say, sit here, you know, you stand over there, you're poor, stand over there, sit on my feet. Then you are judges with evil thoughts. Some of the scholars of the Bible will say, some think this is just a, just a, 
a kind of a generic reference to how you behave. Don't be a judge with evil thoughts. Some people, though, think that maybe this is a reference to a church, to a, a, adjudication in a church dispute. And how awful is it when instead of just listening to the two parties that are struggling, you give more weight to the person who has more money? You know what that's called in the Bible? Evil. Evil. Since I can get something out of this one, I'm going to treat them better. Do you have a little of that in you? Come on. Yeah, you, you do, don't you? you? Your pastor does. I got to be careful about that. I want to make sure that everybody gets treated with special care. Okay, that's just one, the Lord. So when you're tempted to pride or prejudice or partiality, then think about the Lord. And by the way, just a, a little quick thing here. We're talking about what you wear to church. Isn't it interesting? You guys do really well on this. I, the first time I came here, I wore a jacket, and the chairman of the elders talked to me. He says to me, you don't have to wear a jacket. I'm like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> so, the chairman of the elders said that. that. It doesn't get any higher than that. That's like, that's high cotton right there. Chairman of the elders, so you don't have to wear it. Anyway, so, oh, well, that's great. It, it's interesting. The Bible says very little about what you wear in church. But when it does talk about what you wear in church, it says be modest. Which, you know, when I grew up, I took that to mean, you know, don't wear your bikini to church, right? That kind of thing. You don't ever want to see. Yeah. Anyway, but, yeah, that's, but that's not really. Modest is talking especially about pretentious, costly, make other people feel like, oh, I can't be among them because they're all that. Oh, you Read your Bible. Read your New Testament. And when the Bible does talk about what you wear in church, of course you should dress, you know, you should cover up your nakedness and you shouldn't wear things that distract people morally. Of course, the scriptures teach you that. But when the New Testament talks about what you wear in church, the New Testament often talks about modest apparel, meaning you're not showing off your finery. Because how unchrist like a thing would it be to make somebody feel like they can't come and they can't kneel at the cross with you because they don't have some kind of fancy outfit or they don't know the secret handshake or the code ring or, or whatever it is they got to do, cover their tattoos or, or whatever they feel like they got to do to be among, you know, the nice people that probably never did anything wrong. That's craziness. That's not Christian, right? That's not the Jesus followers. And so, so here you have a, a, a gal in our church, not this church, another church I pastored, and she was a young woman that was going to sing that day, and so she put her makeup on like you do. She put her pretty dress on like you do. Her mom was visiting her that week. And so she says, come on, Mom, I'm singing today. And Mom says, oh, no, I can't go to church. Look at me. All I have is this T-shirt and these jeans. And the young woman, who's very spiritually tender-hearted, just turned on her heel and walked away from her mother. And she walked back into the bathroom, and she took her makeup off, and she took her dress off, and she put on a pair of jeans, and she put on a big T-shirt, and she went out there and put around around her mom. She said, come on, mom, let's go to church. And I preached to that lady over and over and over again. Now, I want to tell you something. When you see that lady walking into the church, you might look at her and go, she doesn't have any respect for God, and you would be wrong. Because she had high respect for God. She had respect for one of God's created ones. And that's why she did what she did. So sometimes you can tell people have respect for God because they dress up for church. And sometimes you can't tell they have, people have respect for God because they're careful not to overdress for church. Isn't that interesting? But that's just a little side note. No extra charge for that. Now let's look at the second thing. So we, when we're thinking about pride or prejudice or partiality, we go, wait a minute. Think about the Lord, the Lord of glory who has his kids and his creatures that you don't want to mistreat. Okay? Think about that. Here's another thing. Think about your brother's. Brothers and sisters, we had a little family reunion. My goodness, the, the love of brothers and sisters. The father longs for the brothers and sisters to love each other forever. Never wants them to fuss, right? Hey, look at the text here. It's so beautiful. He says this. It starts in verse 5. Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Those who love him is, 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 is a kind of a code for they're saved. They're Christians. He promised a kingdom to the people who love him. And these people are usually regular folks. Poor, regular folks. But we want to impress people that we can get something from. People with lots of acres or, you know, lots of money. And he says, no, you want to impress people that are going to turn around and oppress you. <laughs> That's what it says. That's what it says right in this text. 
here's what he's getting at. He goes, when you're tempted to pride, prejudice, or partiality, think about the Lord of glory and think about your brothers. Who's going to still be standing in the end? Who's going to be? I often said about my, my children, you know, if they, and they, they got along pretty well. Every once in a while they would maybe have a dispute over a curling iron or something like that and, or a kinking iron or a flattening iron or a straightening iron or some kind of iron. I, sorry, Hope. She told me not to say that anymore. So Hope doesn't really do that. She's an only child now, so she just gets what she wants when she wants. <laughs> anyway. So, so what was I saying? So, so when they're, you know, the kids are like maybe having a, a bit of a dispute, and you're like, here's what you say if you're a dad. You're like, you know what? They're not always going to be sleeping in the next room. You know that, right? Because someday they're going to live like in Oregon or something. And then you're going to live like in Wisconsin. And you're going to just wish you could spend a little bit of time together. I think our Heavenly Father looks down on the church sometimes and goes, would you please get along? Don't you know they're hurting? Don't you know someday you'll long for them? They're your brother. They're your people. Those are your people right there. That's what he says. It's good to remember that. So when I'm tempted to make a funny joke about pride or prejudice or partiality or mistreat somebody or use somebody, I remember that I answer to the Lord of glory. And I remember that I have my brothers and sisters, and they're my people, such as they are. They're, they're my people. We always like to say, they're idiots, but this is their village. <laughs> I know that's not nuts, is it? So you remember you, you, the Lord and you remember your brothers. Here's another one. Remember your Bibles. <laughs> remember your Bibles. This is my little code word for the law of God. Remember your Bible. Remember the Lord. Remember your brothers. Remember your Bible. What's the Bible? This is what James is going to appeal to the law. This is from Leviticus, the Old Testament law carried over and reaffirmed here. Um, he, 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 by the way, has called Jesus the Lord of glory. And then he also says, this, those who are oppressed are going to blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called. He just keeps bringing up Jesus, G, James, the half-brother of Jesus, who came after the resurrection to believe in Jesus, who didn't originally believe in Jesus, we believe, after the resurrection, came to believe in Jesus. He keeps saying he's the Lord of glory. His name is an honorable name that you don't blaspheme. He keeps appealing to the cross and, his, and Christ. And then, he, and then he says, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, say, what's the royal law? You're supposed to say that. Say, what's the royal law? Royal law. Well, it's right here. It says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What's the royal law? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Let's say, what's the royal law? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the royal law. That's the king. That's the law of the king. Love your neighbor as yourself. How did you do this week? Yeah, that's a hard one, isn't it? You might need a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit in you. And it says, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin. Straight terms. You say, well, you know, partiality, you know, adultery, that's a big deal. <laughs> yeah, murder, that's a big deal. Partiality, that's not a big deal. James said, no, it's a big deal. This is what James is saying. If you believe that murder is a big deal, is murder, raise your hand if you think murder is a big deal. Good, I feel safer now. Adultery is, is a major meltdown. It's bad, right? James is saying you got to understand if you if you break the law in adultery, you break the law in murder. You break the law if you if you have partiality, you break in God's law. Just as broken as it would be if you committed adultery or if you commit a murder. And James is just echoing the Sermon on the Mount here. You've heard it's been said by them of old time. You should not commit murder. I'll tell you, don't call people names. Don't, don't speak disregard. If you can remember that you've disregarded somebody and you've called them fool or blockhead, leave your gift at the altar and go make it right with that person that you mistreated verbally. I don't want you to worship me until you go make it right with my little girl that you hurt, my little boy that you hurt. You go take care of that first and then you come and worship me. This is serious stuff. This is the law of God, the royal law. And, la and later on, it says in the same text, and it says, and James says it earlier, he also calls the Bible the perfect law of liberty, meaning when you, when you obey it, it makes you free. Which means if we have this pride and prejudice and partiality towards other people and we treat people differently and we're not open to broken people and we don't think we're broken people, what does it mean? It means that we have broken the law of God, that we're guilty, that we've done evil, that we've committed sin, and, that, and, and, and that's serious stuff. And it's not going to be good for us. There's a, there's a final thing. Um, and that is, so you remember your Lord. 
you remember your brothers, you remember your Bible, and you remember that one day you needed mercy, right? One day you, you, you needed mercy. One day you needed mercy and you, you got it. One day you needed mercy and you got it. One day you said, oh God, I'm sorry. I deserve to go to hell. I'm, I'm corrupt through and through. I, I realize I can't earn my way to you. Is there a way for me? God says, well, yes, I sent my son Jesus who never sinned to, to take your penalty on the cross. No, yes, mercy, I'll take it. You took it, and that's why you're here. That's why you're a Christian if you're a Christian. Because you didn't, you got mercy you didn't deserve, you, and mercy triumphed over judgment. Say hallelujah, even if you're not Pentecostal. Say hallelujah. Mercy triumphed. Oh, it's kind of fun, isn't it? Maybe they got something going there. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy is stronger than judgment. And if you don't give mercy, you know, you, then you, all you get is judgment. That's what it says in verse 13. Look at it in the text. For judgment is without mercy to one who doesn't get this. Judgment with no mercy. For This is repeated. Jesus teaches this over and over again. If you don't give mercy, you don't have mercy. Birthful that are not merciful did not really get it. We cannot say, I am a follower of Jesus, but there's somebody in this world that I will not extend mercy to. Can't say that. You can't, you can't go around saying you're a Christian, but you don't do the basic Christian stuff. Jesus dying on the cross forgives the people who did the worst thing imaginable in the world. And so you should remember Mercy, you receive mercy. And, and let me just say this, and, and that is, please remember this. There are people, this is the main thing I think the Lord put in my heart to, to share with you before we go home and, and eat, and that is um, this Bethel. You are, I love you. I love you. I love this church. God only knows how thankful I am to be here at this nice church with these good people who love the Lord. I'm just so grateful. I thank God every day. I would never say anything to hurt you. It's too good to keep to ourselves. That's what I'm saying. It's just too good to keep to ourselves. This love that we have, that we should go find other people in this broken town, shouldn't we? And we should love them. We should show them mercy. They need mercy. They're all over the place, and their lives are broken, and their marriages are broken, and their kids are hurting, and they live in a broken and fallen world, and they don't even get the storyline. All we have to do is love them and tell them the story. Holy Spirit of God does the rest. We just find people and we love them and pray for them. We pray for them and we love them and we get them to somebody who's good at telling the story. Or we tell the story. Or we show them the story on a film. Or we write it on a, on a, a track. Or we put it on a napkin. We get the story to people. And when they get the story, it changes everything, their whole life and their eternity. There are people that live all around this place who need God's mercy. And then all we have to do is tell them the story. And some of them, God will enlighten them. And God will enliven their hearts. And they will be miraculously and powerfully converted and delivered from their sin. And we'll baptize these people as followers of Jesus. They will join. And then we will, like, not have lived in vain. No matter what you do for a living, you get involved in some of that. You get a taste for that. You'll never get over that. There are people all around us who need mercy. I have a friend, and he's a pastor, and he's not really all that good. I hope he never sees this. He, it's like he would say it himself. He goes, I'm not an intellectual. I'm not an orator. I'm not a scholar. He would say that himself. He came to my office, and because my books were lined up neat, he thought I was smart. <laughs> so he wasn't very smart. You know, so my books were lined up neat. That just means I lined up my books neatly. I have a lot of books, so I will look smart. It's not because I am smart, right? I mean, that was, anyway, so he comes. He says, man, I saw this guy. And he had it all put together. His books were all on it. He goes, not me, man. I'm a wreck, he says. I'm a wreck. I don't know. He said, I can go to seminary. I went to Bible school. Just barely got through Bible school. They picked me up on a Sunday school bus when I was a kid. And then I, they got to kick me out a couple of times. And then I came back and pastored the church. <laughs> so... He's not really all that, he, you know, in, in a way, he isn't that gifted. He's, he's, like, he kind of like, he's kind of a one-hit wonder guy. You ever have a band that's a one-hit wonder? Like, like all the Golden California, the Gatlin brothers, did they ever sing anything else ever? You know what I'm saying? You ever hear them ever sing anything else? I mean, I don't think so. 
Hope they're not watching too. But anyway, he was, he, he, every time you hear him preach, it's variations on the same theme. You know what it is? Here's the theme. There's little boys out there whose lives are broken up. Their parents are probably having trouble and they need Jesus. Would you go get them and bring them here? There are broken people out there that if we're not too fancy and if we're not too high uh, and mighty and if we're not too, like we only intellectuals are allowed here, we might be able to see them come and have their lives completely changed. Let's go get some of them. That's all the dude ever preaches on. Did I tell you he preaches to about 10,000 people a week? He's really not very good, but he preaches to 10,000 people a week. Why is that? Because that's the song he sings. He came to our church, and he looked at the church to see the thousand. It's kind of modern. He looked around, and he said, man, this is a nice, this is a nice building, he said. I'll never forget this. This is really a nice building. You could really have a nice church here. You could go get nice people that have never been divorced. Go get a bunch of people that have never been divorced, never been on drugs, never, you know, gotten drunk, never done anything wrong, and gather them here. It would be a great, but he says, but I will tell you this, there aren't many of them left. Mostly what you're going to find out there is people with brokenness just below the surface of their heart. And if you go and you get them, God will do a mate. That's what I, that's what I want to tell you. This is a nice church. It would be a sin to keep this to ourselves. It'd just be a sin. And don't be, don't be worried. There's a simple way to do this. Pray for people and love them. And when you pray for them and you love them, sometimes they'll listen to your story. You listen to their story, they listen to your story. And then Jesus does the miracle stuff. You don't do the miracle stuff. You just tell the story. You can even get it. To, it's a team effort. It's like, I'm not good at the story. I will pray and love, and I'll get them to Ken. And Ken will be happy to tell the story. <laughs> right? And you, many of you would, would tell the story. And then, and then what happens, you know, people's lives are changed. Pastor James has it right when he said, real Jesus followers are not the people who ask you how many acres you're farming or how much money you make. Or how thin your waist is, or not real Jesus followers. They're out, they're out there looking for broken sinners. This is Jesus came into the world looking for messed up sinner people. A pastor who knows better one time went on Facebook. He was my friend on Facebook. And he went on Facebook and he was kind of young and he, he knew better. But he said, he took a picture at Walmart of some people that were dressed kind of poor. And he mocked these people who were at Walmart who dressed kind of poor. Now, I try to stay out of controversy on Facebook. I just try to inspire people. And I do my controversial stuff like right now when I'm talking to you. But on Facebook, I try to stay out of controversy, but I couldn't help it. This younger pastor, I just put underneath of what he wrote, I put the people that you're making fun of at Walmart. Those are the people that Jesus wept with compassion over them. And to his credit, he said, you know, you're right. I was wrong. Well, next time you're going through Walmart, Target, Jackson, you look around at the people, just think these are the kind of people Jesus wants me to really weep over. Regular people like me. Just he wants me to love them. He wants me to care about them. And if you do, Holly, you'd remember this. Jenny Thompson. There was a girl in our church. Her name was Jenny Thompson many, many years ago. Our girls were little tiny. Hope hadn't come along yet. Our girls were little tiny girls. And every once in a while we would get a babysitter and it would always be Jenny Thompson. Because Jenny Thompson was a good girl. And she was a sweet girl, a kind and loving girl. She was kind to everybody, loving to everybody. And over and over again I would say to, you, to my girls, you see Jenny Thompson? I want you to be like Jenny Thompson. She's nice to everybody. She's kind to everybody. She's still that way. She's grown up and has a family. And that's the way she still is today. I say to my girls, I want you to be like <laughs> I want you to be like Jenny Thompson. There was a girl who was uh, raised in a really poor family. They lost their home in Oklahoma, and she lived on the hard side of town. They didn't have running water back then. They had a they had a pump out in the front, and uh, she had bad acne one year. She had acne on her forehead and her face, and she combed her hair in a really awkward way over her forehead so that people couldn't see her acne. And she was really conscious that she only had one dress. 
and she was so poor. When she was 70 years old, she was talking to her brother, and she said, do you remember that year when we lost our house? And you remember my face all broke out? And you remember that I couldn't always get a bath, and I only had one dress? You remember that? And he goes, well, yeah. And then she named a girl in her school, a girl that was very beautiful, lived up in a big, nice house on a nice end of town. And she said, do you remember when she invited me to her party? And you remember how nice she treated me? I'll never forget that. I'll never forget it. 70 years old, still remembered the kindness of a Christian girl. We have that power. Mercy. Mercy. (laughs) Triumphs over judgment. Pray with me. Lord, I know I'm talking to people who do believe in what I've just said. And they want it to be true about them, and I want it to be true about me. And sometimes it's not. So I pray, pray that you'd forgive us. I pray that you cleanse us. I pray that, Lord, that you would drive such evil out of our hearts, and where we haven't seen it, you'd make it plain. So that, Lord, we could mercy triumph over. Stand, we're going to sing together. Amen.